Black Beauty. My early home. The first place that I can well remember was a large, pleasant meadow with a pond of clear water in it. Some shady trees leaned over it, and rushes and water lilies grew at the deep end. Over the hedge on one side, we looked into a plowed field. And on the other, we looked over a gate at our master's house, which stood by the roadside. At the top of the meadow was a grove of fir trees, and at the bottom, a running brook overhung by a steep bank. While I was young, I lived upon my mother's milk, as I could not eat grass. In the daytime, I ran by her side, and at night, I lay down close by her. When it was hot, we used to stand by the pond in the shade of the trees. And when it was cold, we had a nice warm shed near the grove. As soon as I was old enough to eat grass, my mother used to go out to work in the daytime and come back in the evening. There were six young colts in the meadow besides me. They were older than I was, some were nearly as large as grown up horses. I used to run with them. And had great fun. We used to gallop all together round and round the field as hard as we could go. Sometimes we had rather rough play, for they would frequently bite and kick as well as gallop. One day, when there was a good deal of kicking, my mother whinnied to me to come to her, and then she said, I wish you to pay attention to what I am going to say to you. The colts who live here are very good colts, but they are cart horse colts, and of course they have not learned manners. You have been well bred and well born. Your father has a great name in these parts, and your grandfather won the cup two years at the Newmarket races. Your grandmother had the sweetest temper of any horse I ever knew, and I think you have never seen me kick or bite. I hope you will grow up gentle and good and never learn bad ways. Do your work with a good will, lift your feet up well when you trot, and never bite or kick, even in play. I have never forgotten my mother's advice. I knew she was a wise old horse, and our master thought a great deal of her. Her name was Duchess, but he often called her Pet. Our master was a good, kind man. He gave us good food, good lodging, and kind words. He spoke as kindly to us as he did to his little children. We were all fond of him, and my mother loved him very much. When she saw him at the gate, she would neigh with joy and trot up to him. He would pat and stroke her and say, well, old pet, and how is your little darky? I was a dull black, so he called me darky. Then he would give me a piece of bread, which was very good, and sometimes he brought a carrot for my mother. All the horses would come to him, but I think we were his favorites. My mother always took him to the town on a market day in a light gig. There was a plowboy, Dick, who sometimes came into our field to pluck blackberries from the hedge. When he had eaten all he wanted, he would have what he called fun with the colts, throwing stones and sticks at them to make them gallop. We did not much mind him, for we could gallop off, but sometimes a stone would hit and hurt us. One day he was at this game and did not know that the master was in the next field, but he was there watching what was going on. Over the hedge he jumped in a snap, and catching Dick by the arm, he gave him such a box on the ear as made him roar with the pain and surprise. As soon as we saw the master, we trotted up nearer to see what went on. Bad boy, he said, Bad boy to chase the colts. This is not the first time nor the second, but it shall be the last. There, take your money and go home. I shall not want you on my farm again. 
So we never saw Dick any more. Old Daniel, the man who looked after the horses, was just as gentle as our master, so we were well off. The Hunt Before I was two years old, a circumstance happened which I have never forgotten. It was early in the spring. There had been a little frost in the night, and a light mist still hung over the woods and meadows. I and the other colts were feeding at the lower part of the field when we heard, quite in the distance, what sounded like the cry of dogs. The oldest of the colts raised his head, pricked his ears, and said, There are the hounds! and immediately cantered off, followed by the rest of us to the upper part of the field, where we could look over the hedge and see several fields beyond. My mother and an old riding horse of our master's were also standing near and seemed to know all about it. They have found a hare, said my mother, and if they come this way, we shall see the hunt. And soon the dogs were all tearing down the field of young wheat next to ours. I never heard such a noise as they made. They did not bark, nor howl, nor whine, but kept on a yo, yo, oh, oh, yo, yo, oh, oh, at the top of their voices. After them came a number of men on horseback, some of them in green coats, all galloping as fast as they could. The old horse snorted and looked eagerly after them, and we young colts wanted to be galloping with them, but they were soon away into the fields lower down. Here it seemed as if they had come to a stand. The dogs left off barking and ran about every way with their noses to the ground. They have lost the scent, said the old horse. Perhaps the hare will get off. What hare? I said. Oh, I don't know what hare. Likely enough it may be one of our own hares out of the woods. Any hare they can find will do for the dogs and men to run after. Before long, the dogs began their yo, yo, oh, oh, again, and back they came all together at full speed, making straight for our meadow at the part where the high bank and hedge overhang the brook. Now we shall see the hare, said my mother. And just then a hare, wild with fright, rushed by and made for the woods. On came the dogs. They burst over the bank, leaped the stream, and came dashing across the field followed by the huntsmen. Six or eight men leaped their horses clean over, close upon the dogs. The hare tried to get through the fence. It was too thick, and she turned sharp round to make for the road, but it was too late. The dogs were upon her with their wild cries. We heard one shriek, and that was the end of her. One of the huntsmen rode up and whipped off the dogs, who would soon have torn her to pieces. He held her up by the leg, torn and bleeding, and all the gentlemen seemed well pleased. As for me, I was so astonished that I did not at first see what was going on by the brook. But when I did look, there was a sad sight. Two fine horses were down. One was struggling in the stream, and the other was groaning on the grass. One of the riders was getting out of the water covered with mud. The other lay quite still. His neck is broken, said my mother. And serve him right, too, said one of the colts. I thought the same but my mother did not join with us. Well, no, she said, you must not say that, but though I am an old horse and have seen and heard a great deal, I never yet could make out why men are so fond of this sport. They often hurt themselves, often spoil good horses, and tear up the fields, and all for a hare or a fox or a stag that they could get more easily some other way but we are only horses and don't know. While my mother was saying this, we stood and looked on. Many of the riders had gone to the young man, 
But my master, who had been watching what was going on, was the first to raise him. His head fell back and his arms hung down, and everyone looked very serious. There was no noise now. Even the dogs were quiet and seemed to know that something was wrong. They carried him to our master's house. I heard afterward that it was young George Gordon, the squire's only son, a fine, tall young man and the pride of his family. There was now riding off in all directions to the doctors, to the farriers, and no doubt to Squire Gordon's, to let him know about his son. When Mr. Bond, the farrier, came to look at the black horse that lay groaning on the grass, he felt him all over and shook his head. One of his legs was broken. Then someone ran to our master's house and came back with a gun. Presently there was a loud bang and a dreadful shriek, and then all was still. The black horse moved no more. My mother seemed much troubled. She said she had known that horse for years, and that his name was Rob Roy. He was a good horse, and there was no vice in him. She never would go to that part of the field afterward. Not many days after, we heard the church bell tolling for a long time, and looking over the gate, we saw a long, strange black coach that was covered with black cloth and was drawn by black horses. After that came another, and another, and another, and all were black while the bell kept tolling, tolling. They were carrying young Gordon to the churchyard to bury him. He would never ride again. What they did with Rob Roy I never knew, but t'was all for one little hair. Bertwick Park At this time I used to stand in the stable, and my coat was brushed every day till it shone like a rook's wing. It was early in May when there came a man from Squire Gordon's who took me away to the hall. My master said, Goodbye, Darky. Be a good horse, and always do your best. I could not say goodbye, so I put my nose into his hand. He patted me kindly, and I left my first home. As I lived some years with Squire Gordon, I may as well tell something about the place. Squire Gordon's park skirted the village of Birtwick. It was entered by a large iron gate at which stood the first lodge, and then you trotted along on a smooth road between clumps of large old trees, then another lodge and another gate which brought you to the house and the gardens. Beyond this lay the home paddock, the old orchard, and the stables. There was accommodation for many horses and carriages, but I need only describe the stable into which I was taken. This was very roomy, with four good stalls. A large swinging window opened into the yard, which made it pleasant and airy. The first stall was a large square one, shut in behind with a wooden gate. The others were common stalls, good stalls, but not nearly so large. It had a low rack for hay and a low manger for corn. It was called a loose box because the horse that was put into it was not tied up, but left loose to do as he liked. It is a great thing to have a loose box. Into this fine box the groom put me. It was clean, sweet, and airy. I never was in a better box than that, and the sides were not so high but that I could see all that went on through the iron rails that were at the top. He gave me some very nice oats, he patted me, spoke kindly, and then went away. When I had eaten my corn, I looked round. In the stall next to mine stood a little fat gray pony with a thick mane and tail, a very pretty head, and a pert little nose. 
I put my head up to the iron rails at the top of my box and said, How do you do? What is your name? He turned round as far as his halter would allow, held up his head, and said, My name is Merrylegs. I am very handsome. I carry the young ladies on my back, and sometimes I take our mistress out in the low chair. They think a great deal of me, and so does James. Are you going to live next door to me in the box? I said, yes. Well then, he said, I hope you are good-tempered. I do not like anyone next door who bites. Just then a horse's head looked over from the stall beyond. The ears were laid back, and the eye looked rather ill-tempered. This was a tall chestnut mare with a long, handsome neck. She looked across to me and said, So it is you who have turned me out of my box. It is a very strange thing for a colt like you to come and turn a lady out of her own home. I beg your pardon, I said. I have turned no one out. The man who brought me put me here, and I had nothing to do with it. And as to my being a colt, I am turned four years old and am a grown-up horse. I never had words yet with horse or mare, and it is my wish to live at peace. Well, she said, we shall see. Of course I do not want to have words with a young thing like you. I said no more. In the afternoon when she went out, Merrylegs told me all about it. The thing is this, said Merrylegs. Ginger has a bad habit of biting and snapping. That is why they call her Ginger. And when she was in the loose box, she used to snap very much. One day, she bit James in the arm and made it bleed. And so Miss Flora and Miss Jessie, who are very fond of me, were afraid to come into the stable. They used to bring me nice things to eat an apple or a carrot or a piece of bread. But after Ginger stood in that box, they dared not come, and I missed them very much. I hope they will now come again if you do not bite or snap. I told him I never bit anything but grass, hay, and corn, and could not think what pleasure Ginger found in it. Well, I don't think she does find pleasure, says Merrylegs. It is just a bad habit. She says no one was ever kind to her, and why should she not bite? Of course, it is a very bad habit, but I am sure if all she says be true, she must have been very ill-used before she came here. John does all he can to please her, and James does all he can, and our master never uses a whip if a horse acts right. So I think she might be good-tempered here. You see, he said with a wise look, I am twelve years old, I know a great deal, and I can tell you there is not a better place for a horse all round the country than this. John is the best groom that ever was. He has been here fourteen years, and you never saw such a kind boy as James is, so that it is all Ginger's own fault that she did not stay in that box. A Fair Start The name of the coachman was John Manley. He had a wife and one little child, and they lived in the coachman's cottage, very near the stables. The next morning he took me into the yard and gave me a good grooming, and just as I was going into my box with my coat soft and bright, the squire came in to look at me and seemed pleased. John, he said, I meant to have tried the new horse this morning, but I have other business. You may as well take him around after breakfast. Go by the common and the highwood and back by the watermill and the river. That will show his paces. I will, sir, said John. After breakfast, he came and fitted me with a bridle. He was very particular in letting out and taking in the straps to fit my head comfortably. 
Then he brought a saddle, but it was not broad enough for my back. He saw it in a minute and went for another, which fitted nicely. He rode me first slowly, then a trot, then a canter, and when we were on the common, he gave me a light touch with his whip, and we had a splendid gallop. Ho, ho, my boy, he said as he pulled me up. You would like to follow the hounds, I think. As we came back through the park, we met the squire and Mrs. Gordon walking. They stopped, and John jumped off. Well, John, how does he go? First rate, sir, answered John. He is as fleet as a deer, and has a fine spirit, too. But the lightest touch of the rain will guide him. Down at the end of the common, we met one of those traveling carts hung all over with baskets, rugs, and such like. You know, sir, many horses will not pass those carts quietly. He just took a good look at it and then went on as quiet and pleasant as could be. They were shooting rabbits near the highwood, and a gun went off close by. He pulled up a little and looked, but did not stir a step to right or left. I just held the reins steady and did not hurry him, and it's my opinion he has not been frightened or ill-used while he was young. That's well, said the squire. I will try him myself tomorrow. The next day I was brought up for my master. I remembered my mother's counsel and my good old master's, and I tried to do exactly what he wanted me to do. I found he was a very good rider and thoughtful for his horse, too. When he came home, the lady was at the hall door as he rode up. Well, my dear, she said, how do you like him? He is exactly what John said, he replied, a more pleasant creature I never wish to mount. What shall we call him? Would you like Ebony, said she? He is as black as ebony. No, not ebony. Will you call him Blackbird, like your uncle's old horse? No, he is far handsomer than old Blackbird ever was. Yes, she said. He is really quite a beauty, and he has such a sweet, good-tempered face, and such a fine, intelligent eye. What do you say to calling him... Black beauty. Black beauty. Why, yes, I think that is a very good name. If you like, it shall be his name. And so it was.